Hi, everyone. My name is Charles Jung. I'm the executive director of the California Asian Pacific American Bar Association, or CALAPAPA. And CALAPAPA and our co-host, the Faith and Community uh, Empowerment, or FACE, uh, we're so uh, pleased and honored to welcome you to the first part of our series, uh, which is entitled Going There, Black and Asian, Tough Conversations and True Allyship. Uh, first, uh, we'd like to extend our uh, deep appreciation to our 30 uh, community co-sponsors from around the country for supporting us and for spreading the word. Uh, the first time uh, I was approached to speak on a topic like this uh, for a sister organization on this topic of Black and Asian conflict and solidarity, I went home and I told my uh, wife about it and her immediate reaction was, don't do it. And, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are tough conversations for sure, but, uh, you know, on reflection, that's uh, exactly the point, because each of our communities uh, has had uh, discussions about the other community, uh, some reflecting pretty strong opinions and not all of them uh, uniform. But if we stay in that place, uh, that place of fear where we're afraid to speak to each other uh, directly, then, uh, you know, uh, one questions how, uh, how genuine the allyship can be. Um, earlier this year, uh, only three miles from my home uh, in San Francisco in what's called the Anza Vista neighborhood, an 84-year-old Thai grandfather named Devisha Ratanapakti uh, was killed. Uh, there was no apparent economic motivation. He uh, was simply uh, pushed to the ground where his head hit the concrete and he had a brain hemorrhage and uh, later passed away. Uh, the, the security uh, footage showed the accused, uh, who uh, turned out to be a 19-year-old African-American uh, uh, man. Um, it, that incident is not solitary or unique. Uh, the community organization Stop API Hate uh, in the time period from uh, March 2020 through March 2021 in that one-year time period received over 6,600 incidents uh, of hate, hate incidents and potential hate crimes against members of the uh, Asian American community. And, uh, you know, I was taken by my story, uh, by the story of my friend uh, Hate Pin uh, M who is the CEO of Faith and Community Empowerment. Uh, and she shared her personal uh, story of uh, transformation uh, uh, and a painful moment that she experienced with her mentor, Dr. Mark Whitlock. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Hippin and uh, invite her to speak to that story and uh, also introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you, Charles, uh, again, for your partnership uh, and all the partnering organizations who have joined us uh, for this very important conversation. Again, my name is Hei Pin Im, and I run a nonprofit called Faith and Community Empowerment. And um, we've been, we celebrate 20 years of uh, serving the community, but my model actually came from the first Amy Church, uh, led by Pastor Cecil Murray, and also then the economic development upper by Dr. Mark Whitlock. And uh, I have to say that um, that my journey with him has been amazing. Uh, we were sharing the other day that um, if I had not met him, all the great work that we have been able to do would never have happened. And so again, I'm so grateful for his friendship, his support, mentorship. And along the way, I have to say that he even came to toast at my wedding. And yet uh, there was this one space that I felt that I could not speak to him and I held close to my heart, which is especially after the Los Angeles riots and next year is the 30th anniversary that I knew that whether it was uh, Dr. Mark Whitlock or so many other great African-American leaders that I respect and appreciate that we did not agree on how uh, the Asian Korean 
uh, store owners and black customers, that relationship was kind of a no-no. And um, I always felt kind of like there was so much more to this truth and that if we could come together, that our relationship, our communities would be so much stronger. But how do we, you know, bridge that uh, gap? And I felt almost like a someone who had a boyfriend that my parents didn't appreciate. And how how could I get them together, right, to love one another so that we could move forward? And and so again, long story short, I have to say that this past year, you know, with over sixty six hundred incidents of anti Asian hate, but really the Atlanta massacre, um, I think was a tipping point for us as an Asian American. Uh, and AAPI community members where we have cried out for so long to say, we need help. Uh, we're in the same boat, um, particularly there's 50 groups, 20 countries, you know, 100 languages under AAPI. And when you lump us all of us together, um, that we are all, you know, uh, what is it? It erases a lot of the pains of the subgroups. And at the end of the day, um, there's so many places where we are all in the same economic wheelchair. And so if we come together, our voices will be so much stronger and our community could be so much better. And so, again, long story short, um, after the Atlanta massacre, uh, Dr. Willock uh, and Dr. Uh, Barbara Williams Skinner, um, as well as uh, Bishop Almer, um, reached out to me to say, how can I help? And I have to say that I, you know, it was a tremendous opportunity and window. And I thought, how do I be a good steward of this opportunity? And I have to say, long story short, um, I'm so, so grateful uh, that these great leaders with the leadership of Dr. Walter Kim, as well as a number of few other leaders who were who are not able to join us for this conversation in the last uh, two, three, uh, several months, I would say, uh, we've been able to do some amazing things and this opportunity is one. But I do want to go back to Dr. Willock. So um, recently we had this conversation and he made this comment, which in some ways acknowledged perhaps a perspective of perhaps the Asian community when we talk about race relations in this country, a lot of times we're erased and it tends to be a binary framework. Um, and in that way, our voices sound, seem so small or so left to feel that we don't matter. And so it's just, and he made some comments that just made me cry, <laughs> wanna cry, and I told him that. And in that moment, um, as I'm saying it, I really did end up crying, but I felt like um, there was kind of a new season, new chapter, uh, because of that moment. And um, I have to say that also um, he volunteered to do an op-ed and he titled it Asian Lives Matter. And I have to say that that was very courageous of him <laughs> in the context of our current climate uh, and to fight for and to be successful in getting this article published in some major uh, African-American publications, including the AME Christian Recorder that goes to all the AME Black pastors across the country and around the world, for which I'm grateful. One last piece. Um, in our conversation, I remember Dr. Uh, William Skinner just saying, you know what? I'm not so sure it's so much about hate, but it's about indifference. We really don't know you guys. And so we just need to just stop hating and start connecting. And I think that has been just the beauty of, of our relationships. And I have to say, I'm, today, you know, I've been staying at Dr. Skinner's home, Dr. Skinner Williams, Williams home, and it's just been amazing. And so I really look forward to this honest conversation um, that for many of my uh, black ally friends, when they're in this space, they tell me that sometimes they get knives in the back <laughs> from their own communities. They say, why are you there? And I think in that way, we need to have these conversations. Um, and when I'm in the social media rooms, I see that on, on the left side, people go straight to white um, supremacy, but really don't recognize some of the pain that's happening between our, uh, our communities, especially in light of the black on Asian, the optics of black on Asian crimes. 
And then the on the right, I'm seeing so many, uh, again, Asians saying, you know what, the police is not going to protect us. We need to gun up. And both conversations, both strategies are not going to take us to where we all want to go, which is, again, a place of unity, place of strength, and place of prosperity, prosperity for all of us. So with that, I am going to introduce all our speakers. Um, so we have first, as mentioned, Dr. Mark Whitlock, uh, who is the senior pastor of Reed Temple AME. It's the historic largest AME church in this country. Um, and he has so many other titles, but I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm also going to introduce Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner. Um, so she is the co-convener co of the National African American clergy networker, for also former executive director, founding executive director of the Black Congressional Caucus. We have also Bishop Kenneth Ulmer, uh, who is the presiding bishop of Faithful Central Baptist Church, but head of his own denomination, and again, resident uh, icon uh, leader, uh, for sure, in the community. But last but not least, I want to also then acknowledge and introduce uh, Dr. Walter Kim. He is the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. This is a historic, influential organization that has the heads of denominations of major, particularly evangelical groups, but also national Christian organizations. Um, and he recently came to the helm, I believe in the past year, that has traditionally been led uh, by, you know, um, white leadership and so he also has a tough road and he knows how to balance between navigating in that space as well as working with communities of color so very grateful to dr kim as well uh thank you everyone and welcome to you all and great to see your faces today um i'll uh i'll uh, i'll throw out the first question uh which is one on the our specific topic so uh, wanted to ask each of you uh, what what led you to focus on this issue of black and uh, Asian solidarity? In other words, what got your attention and uh, what why is the topic uh, important to you personally? And maybe I could start with uh, Dr. Whitlock. First, Charles, thank you for the opportunity and thank you, uh, Haypen, for the opportunity to share uh, some very personal feelings. Um, I've known Haypen for over 30 years, and I've been in the business of civil rights uh, for 50. So she has known me the majority of that um, time that I've committed to social justice, civil rights, making sure we level the playing field. Um, and I have to admit uh, that um, Haypen opened or certainly removed the scales from my eyes, where I really thought that we were practicing the Christian principle of love your neighbor as you love yourself. But I was really only talking about loving black neighbors. Uh, I had some relationships with the Latino community, absolutely one relationship with him, with the Asian community, and that was Hey Penn. Knew a lot, but only knew Hey Penn personally. She and I worked together at First AME Church. First AME Church is uh, the oldest black church in Los Angeles. 1872 established one of the larger black churches in Los Angeles, known for its civil rights, known for its community development. Hey, Penn and I worked together. She was excellent in the business of community development, raising funds for social, raising funds for entrepreneurs, primarily African American entrepreneurs. And I had this feeling that I was close to her, but in the same breath, I didn't really know her. And I have to admit, uh, it was my own since my own racial bias. Um, I, I've had conversations about the challenges uh, with black Asian relations, particularly the Korean community following the Sunja Du uh, challenge in, uh, uh, I think it was 91, that it takes place where a young woman is, is killed by a Korean store owner and she doesn't receive any time. She doesn't, she isn't sentenced like African-Americans to uh, long moments in jail, long, long years in jail, perhaps even a death sentence, she's let free. And so this, 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 uh, this, this created a, an uproar in the community. And this is where uh, it, it was a not an aha moment, but all of a sudden I found myself thinking about Ralph Ellison 
in his book, The Invisible Man. And one of his quotes that moves me more than any other is he said, when I discover who I am, I'll be free. When I discover who I am, I'll be free. And then I realized it's really me. I, I have this, this bias, this, this, this compartmentalized relationship with the Asian community. And so when Hapen and I connected following the March uh, massacre, in my opinion, I had already made up my mind. I need to do more than just simply give voice to it. I need to get actively involved with it. I was fed up with uh, politicians, particularly the president talking about Chinese food. I was fed up with uh, elected officials. I was also fed up with my brothers and sisters in the ministry that when I would raise the question about Asian uh, African-American relationship, I know I would find muted voices. I would find nobody interested in the conversation. I can't hear, but. Charles, you need to. Unmute. Yeah, maybe I could turn it to uh, Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner with the same question. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, well I was, I was, as a young child, child student, um, always excited about history. And I, it was really clear to me growing up that we, the people, the preamble to the Constitution to form a, a more perfect union, establish justice, and Domestic tranquility didn't include people who look like me. It was always clear. And didn't include people of color, period. So probably in my DNA was kind of a sense that I needed to do something about that. I never knew what. But so I had this sense that, you know, I would need to be part of making sure that everybody was included in the we the people. On the other hand, growing up in Richmond, California which is mostly all black. The only encounter we had with um, Asians, because I honestly, we didn't know whether Korean, Chinese, whatever, but we got, you know, a lot of Chinese food, but we also had Korean, we thought, store owners. And those encounters were not very pleasant. <laughs> we, I remember being in the store as a, as a girl and watching an older black lady who looked really harmless to everybody. Um, with a, putting her money in the, reaching out her hand and put her money. And this happened more than once. It wasn't just one per time. Give her money into the hand. You know, you give your dollars. And the other lady drew, the lady who was a store owner drew her hand back and then pointed to the, to the counter, like put your money there. And then put her money, put, gave her the change back in a, in a real kind of, disgusting way, like she was not about to touch her hand. That happened so many times. That was the other opposite end of my we the people desire, that everybody be part of the we the people. So fast forward um, to that time that I met Haypin on a countless Zoom call. I mean, I, I lamented when, when the um, massacre took place in Atlanta, again, out of that spirit of growing up that everybody should be treated uh, as children of God. But I also had this sense, this, you know, this experience with Asians that was like, no hello, no good morning, just, you know, just, you know, you happen to be in the store, so you put your money on the counter, which is so totally disrespectful. So I carried that forward without, you know, being uh, from Berkeley, Oakland, we were always involved in coalition politics. So I probably, that was probably in the back of my gut but I still tried to work through coalition. And it wasn't until I met Hey Ping through these countless Zoom calls post COVID or during COVID rather, that I heard a presentation by her that was so amazing. I'm, I'm a student of fact, so leave the emotion, but she laid out how it took, and shocking me thinking I'm a well aware uh, of, of history and fact, facts about how Asians, who you think about as quiet, model minority, don't bother anybody, um, so they don't have any problems like we do as black people, um, that she's laying out that some of the criminal justice statistics look the same as black and brown people, uh, some of the issues of home ownership. 
uh, banking issues, issues of top positions in the corporations, you know, not being hired as superman, a top manager. I was blown away. And I think by that time, even on Zoom, you could bond with people. And I think Hapian and I kind of connected with each other, sort of in an interesting way through Zoom. But when I heard her, I had two reactions, one of which embarrasses me to tell, but I will tell it. My first reaction was, she's talking, she's giving this presentation to white evangelicals and white mainline people who won't even give you know black black people the time of day. So why are they listening to another group? So I'm feeling like a slight tinge of resentment, like, okay. But then at my better self, I think the core of my being is still always about we the people, no matter what happens. And then as the follower of Jesus, I'm always like trying to figure what would Jesus do in this setting? But I'm honest about my feelings. I'm feeling like a little resentful. You're not even dealing with black people and now you wanna bring in an Asian group. So the better part of me by the end of that presentation was so overwhelming. I did say during the end of the meeting, during Q and A to Hapian, I'd like to get to know you. I, you know, how can I help? And we spent an hour, two hours on the phone one Saturday because you can't do projects with people you don't, you can't really do life with people you don't know. You can do projects. And when the project is over, you don't know them anymore. But we spent time together. I invited her to my home this time and we've hung out. We did facials together. We did you know, all the things that people do, women like to do. I don't know about men, but it, it helped us to see one another as people, not titles and not a racial or ethnic category. So that, that's really kind of how I entered this picture. Thank you for those comments, uh, Dr. William Skinner, and for that story. It definitely paints a picture for me personally. I uh, wonder if I could turn it over to uh, 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 Reverend Kim, the same question. Yeah. Thank you, Charles, and thank you uh, to the other panelists for being a part not only of this present conversation, but for the larger conversation that has been unfolding. Um, with respect to my own personal engagement and development in this issue of solidarity, I, I would say there are two aspects to it. There's faith and there's friendship. So um, in the Bible, uh, you know, it's a story that I was quite familiar with um, for years, the story of the Exodus, the delivery of God's people from slavery in Egypt. But only recently did I catch a phrase uh, in that story in the book of Exodus. Uh, and that phrase was this, uh, as Israel was leaving slavery in Egypt, many other people went with them. And I don't know how I didn't read that portion of the Bible story beforehand, or having read it, didn't let it sink in. But in this past year, um, it really began to sink in that the deliverance of God's people from slavery included not just the Israelites, but many other people who had experienced oppression in Egypt and needed deliverance. And that um, the story of God's people right from the very beginning of the Bible is a story of a mixed multitude of ethnicities being delivered, redeemed by God. And, and that began to um, reshape my understanding of my own faith and the biblical mandate that exists for solidarity, for the work um, of, of God in this world, including in, in a very essential way, not just as a tangential way, but in, in an essential way, the work of reconciliation and building out this beautiful community of multiple uh, races and ethnicities. Um, but that faith needed to also be coupled with friendship. So about four years ago, uh, after living 20 years uh, in Boston and having been born in New York City and lived in northern cities uh, for all my life, about four years ago, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, interviewing on August 12, 2017 for taking up a pastorate in Charlottesville. And if you recall, that was the very day that the Unite the Right rally had occurred in Charlottesville and the racial unrest. So even as I'm interviewing for this position, we're getting reports coming in of what's happening in a different part of our city. Uh, as I 
took up that position, I began to realize that the essential work um, of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in that place really did need to include this work of racial justice and reconciliation. Uh, some of my staff members uh, are African American. Obviously, I'm Asian American. And we also had um, a pretty significant uh, Chinese student population that was a part of our church which was a predominantly white evangelical church. Um, what my experience has, of friendship has been is a recognition that it's not simply enough to have sympathy for what other people are going through, maybe even sympathy for common experiences that we've had about racial injustice, but it had to include solidarity, which is more than just sympathy. It is actually entering into and owning the pain of other people, owning the stories of other people, entering into the history of other people, which in Charlottesville, a very painful racial history for the African-American community. Uh, and so faith and friendship has been really essential in reframing the kind of relationship that exists and needs to exist between the African-American and Asian-American community and um, the friendship that's developing uh, in this group of folks that are having these honest conversations is the kind of representation of what I really believe is an essential part uh, of the faith of all who would um, call themselves Christian. Thank you, Reverend Kim. Uh, and wonder if I could ask the same question of Bishop Ulmer. Uh, Bishop Ulmer, uh, you know, what, what personally leads you to focus on uh, this question of Black and Asian uh, solidarity? You know, I don't really have a very exotic story, um, not quite as dramatic as some of my colleagues. Uh, I grew up in a place called East St. Louis, Illinois. East St. Louis, not St. Louis. Trust me, there is a difference. I had never seen, uh, I certainly did not know anyone of Asian descent uh, except kind of like Barbara said, we had a, that was a place we go, we used to go to get chop suey food, but we never knew them. Uh, so I had no, no connection with the community at all. Even when it's been my high school, I don't even remember having any relationship with, uh, you know, with, with, with any of my Asian brothers and sisters. I, I knew two things about the Asian community, little and nothing. I think my aha moment was more, more, more recent than that. Um, I, I was 30 years old and, and I've been in school all my life, but I was 30 years old before I even knew that there were any black people in the Bible. Uh, and I had been to seminaries and, and, and religious schools and Bible schools and stuff. And no, no one told me that there were any black people in the Bible. That was my first problem. They certainly did not tell me that there were any Asians in the Bible. And so something as mundane as realizing that on the day of Pentecost, uh, there were Asians there. Uh, that that blew my mind. I mean, I I was surprised to see us there. But when they uh, when I carefully read the scriptures and discovered that the Bible says clearly there were you you don't have to put them in. They're already there. Yet nobody told us we were there. And so it's it's part of that theological structure and, and journey that I've been on. Uh, that was my first aha. The second was more recently and even more painful. There's a young lady in our church. Uh, by the name of Judy Kim. Uh, Judy Kim is a member of our church. She's a member of our praise team, our singers. Uh, she's been here several years. She's a student at Biola University. And when all of the publicity about Asians being attacked occurred, she told me a very painful story. She told me that in a discussion with um, some of her fellow singers in, in our praise team, uh, uh, how bad she felt because the, the, her, her, her colleagues on the, on the, in, in the choir, uh, she said, were very dismissive of her. And she made this point. She said, you know, I stood with you guys, and now you guys are not standing with me. And it broke her heart. And when she told me that, it broke my heart. Uh, just to see the, the, the roots and the, um, uh, the, the prevalence, I guess, of the dichotomies and us against them and, and, and you know, that group against this group. Uh, another flag was when the whole COVID thing was, um, what, uh, ethnicized, I'll say. You know, the idea of, of a national figure saying this is an Asian issue, this is a Chinese issue, this is a Chinese virus. 
and and I painfully feared what would happen that did happen, that that would spread and that it was going to be like a snowball going down a hill. And so sure enough, sure enough, we began to hear more and more reports of, of, of attacks and, and violence. Uh, and I'm connecting these dots and it broke my heart. It broke my heart. And I think that, that that's kind of what, what Walter's talking about, about solidarity is more than just saying something. It's about a connection, a heart connection, a soul connection. And it broke my heart because I realized, wow, what they did to us, they're doing it to them. We're, we're kind of in the same boat here. And so um, uh, it's been very frustrating. It's been very painful. Uh, but my wake up moment was Kim, Judy Kim, a member of our church, faithful member of our church, a dedicated member, dear friend, uh, and a parishioner who said, said Bishop, uh, it's hard to be Asian right here. That broke my heart. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that motivated me along with the political stuff and the, and the news reports, et cetera. Um, and I'm still struggling with it. Uh, I wonder if I could ask, um, so, uh, you know, the, the story uh, Bishop Ulmer references is, uh, and we know who that particular political leader is who uh, used the, the phrases uh, Kung flu and uh, China virus and, uh, you know, uh, led to, although not solely, uh, you know, the, the spade and uh, anti-Asian hate and, and violence. But uh, each of us hears these stories uh, about the other community. Uh, and uh, wondering if I could ask, uh, and maybe I'll uh, start with Dr. Whitlock if he's willing. You know, what are the those uh, what are those stories, those communications that uh, you're hearing uh, in uh, in uh, your community uh, about the other, the those pernicious stereotypes that cause you concern. muted and dr willock you probably before want to hear. writing the article uh, with hey pen um i posted on facebook what are your feelings about the asian community very few people responded what are your feelings about partnering with the asian community very few of my colleagues very few of my friends and I've probably got about 30,000 and on, on Facebook. So it, it, it was it was a surprise for me that there was this uh, avalanche of silence, uh, a muted uh, concern. And, and, and so this summer, I, we wanted to introduce legislation or certainly a uh, resolution for our church and our national conference, uh, we call it the General Conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. But we were challenged with everything else that was going on, even to get that move through where we would uh, stand in solidarity against Asian hate. We will get it done, but still there was the question about what's going on and, and why do we need to do this? Um, it, I, I think if I can answer it specifically, the story that Bishop and uh, Dr. William Skinner and, and my colleagues are sharing is we don't have an opportunity often to sit down and listen to a hey pen M and watch her tears uh, about her feeling. In fact, it, it almost felt for me like we were acting much like our white counterpart. Uh, we would look at individual cases and then do a broad brush for the entire race. Where as I looked at Hey Penn and I said, man, uh, we need not only to uh, come together and deal with uncomfortable conversations, but we have to make a commitment to do something about it after the conversation has taken place. So for me, as I wrap this up, um, in our community, in the community that I'm in, there's no conversation or the community that I'm in is that why are we worried about that? Uh, we have so many other things to deal with as if the Asian community is not a part of the community that we worship with. Uh, and if I could uh, uh, ask uh, Bishop uh, Ulmer, uh, what are you hearing, Bishop? You know, I, I, I wanna refer back to a mentor of several of us, certainly uh, Dr. Woodlock and I, 
uh, uh, Dr. Chip Murray. And I, I'm going to have flashbacks now to the uh, the uprising here in Los Angeles between the Korean community and the Black and African American community, and even before that with the Jewish community. I never forget this. Uh, someone asked uh, Dr. Murray, "What does the Black community think about the Jewish community?" Key question. They said, "What, Dr. Murray?" What does the black community think about the Jewish community? And Dr. Murray's answer was nothing. Nothing. We, we don't. We don't. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm finding, uh, at least in, in my circles, and, I, and I'm not in, in circles as large as some of my colleagues, but, but I, I'm like Mark. I'm not hearing a lot of conversations. I think that's the value of what we're doing right now is to promote conversation. It is to initiate conversations because I don't hear enough of it. You know, I, I had a conversation with, uh, uh, I was in, I had a student, uh, I was teaching at Oxford and one of my students uh, from Dallas, uh, we were doing a thing about, uh, about racism and reconciliation. And, and this first, I, that was the first time I heard about the, the myth, the, the, uh, the model myth of, of the Asian community and how society historically has kind of played Asian community against the black community and held up the Asian community as, as you know, the, the standard of, of, uh, of, of immigrants that have come in and made it. And why can't you guys be like them? That was my first conversation. And so, again, the key, the, the conversations are few and far between. I think that's why what we're trying to do. We're trying to promote more uh, because from, from a denominational level, as Dr. Mark, Dr. Whitlock just indicated, down to a classroom level, uh, as my student was at Oxford, and, and then on a personal level, I, we're not having enough conversations. And yet there's a real sense in which we, we, we're in the same boat, you know. Uh, and so we, we certainly have, as the cliche goes, we have more in common than we have that separates us. And I hope that that's what this kind of conversation sparks and breeds, that we're able to come together uh, and discuss and disagree and, and, and be vulnerable and say, you know, that hurt me, that pit, what can I say that, pit, that upset me uh, more, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's the, the key is the conversation. That's what I want to say. The key is the conversation. That's where we start and we can move on from there. And Dr. Kim, if I could ask you uh, about that conversation. Yeah, I, I appreciate these comments so much. They're really right to the point, both the fact that there is oftentimes no conversation or conversations that go sideways. And um, I, I would say the part of the challenge is that when we talk about what are you hearing in your community about the other community, is that it's not really fair to say community. We really have to talk about communities. So in the Asian American Pacific Islander communities, we're talking about scores of languages, very different cultural experiences of immigration. And depending on what your experience is, immigration pattern, longevity in America, language, where you live in the country, your experience could be quite different. So you may have a recent immigrant who is leaving a very successful career in East Asia and wants to just give their kids a better opportunity. I would have to say, honestly, some within the Asian, community, Asian American community reinforce the model minority myth because they reinforce this. We got educated, we're gonna give you a good education, just work hard and you can achieve. And why, why don't other communities do that? So I want to acknowledge that the modern minority myth is not simply something that's placed onto the Asian American community, but there are some within the Asian American community that have actually embraced it. There are others whose experience is tragic. They have left war torn countries in deep poverty and they enter into this country and have perpetual poverty follow them. Their experience and their conversations are very different. So part of the challenge is, you know, the desire for uh, the AAPI uh, to appeal to our African-American brothers and sisters and say, recognize that our stories are very, very different. And it's even hard to have a conversation where you don't even know what your conversation partner, what their life experience is to, to begin that conversation. So this, of course, there's the Judy Kim, but there's also the Hmong and their experience. There's also those who are coming 
from a wealthy East Asian background seeking to give their kids just a leg up. And then there's the refugee. Uh, it, it's a vast range of experiences that make conversations even more challenging because you can't assume a common experience that you can build upon other than the common experience of having discrimination as part of our life stories. And that's just awfully challenging. Um, but at the same time, it's the kind of work that when it's done, it leads to a beautiful sense of possibility, not only possibility of faith, but possibility for this country. Thank you, doctor. And uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, Hippen uh, to comment. So I think for me, I shared earlier about kind of my painful journey of feeling like the uh, person with the boyfriend that your parents don't approve. And I would say that, you know, when I was here, some of the black leaders make comments, uh, I would say these are very good people. And I know that they would normally, you know, respond with empathy if someone says, you know, they've lost their livelihood or something like that. And that made me seek understanding of why, why this kind of disconnect and what I've seen uh, in kind of the aha moment is that there are certain narratives that are being told about the API community because of the lack of connection. And, and then the, the, the individual encounters at times with the store owners per se. And I want to say that these store owners are not all evil <laughs> per se, but, um, but there are certain narratives that put them into that category of evil. And when you do violence on evil or, you know, then it's actually you're, you're fighting for good. And that's kind of the disconnect that I saw that I wanted to really help bridge that gap. Um, and I think for the Asian community, um, you know, there are, again, certain images that are in the media, in the movies that portray um, the African American community, but also then for many of these store owners, they do encounter the violence because they are many times the, the only businesses that they could afford because they're dirt poor too, are in neighborhoods where there may be high crime rates and people are suffering from poverty. And so then they are also then recipients of that violence, whether it's, you know, gun violence or just shoplifting or, you know, all those kind of things that also then reinforce certain images. And yet for me, I have to say, again, I learned from Dr. Willock, right? Uh, this amazing model about partnership that really allows for mutuality and for really, again, multiplication of resources that you take from scarcity to abundance. And so, um, and again, so many black leaders, black community has fought, you know, for civil rights. I mean, as Asians have been there too, but a lot of times we're invisible in the race, but again, it has been this leadership uh, from the black community that we have been beneficiaries that we could learn from. And I think that some of those lessons, again, are also invisible to the Asian community because we're all down. No, there are many of us who are just trying to survive and they are then encountering and being, you know, uh, hitting one another with much pain. And so, um, I think that that's the space that we need to acknowledge and figure out how can we be all on the same team <laughs> together um, as well. Thank you, Hipton. Uh, and I wonder if I could uh, switch topics for a moment. So, uh, 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 Reverend Kim. Dr. Skinner uh, hasn't responded. Dr. Skinner hasn't okay. responded to your second question. Yes. Um, Mute it. Dr. Skinner, you will need to unmute. I'm trying to follow the instruction. Um, 53 years ago after the Watts riot, um, when the Kerner report came out, I know in fact, uh, Bishop Olmer and others will remember, it said that there were two societies, one white and one black. And I think the larger context of just saying that and the, and the larger conversation in America is black and white. And I always wondered, you know, what other um, uh, cultures feel about that? It's like they don't exist. And so I think that what I have become more sensitive to myself 
is, as an African American at the table, is thinking about what it's like to be left out of conversations with white people and how other people must, how Latinos and, and Asian Americans and indigenous Americans who aren't even in our conversation must feel uh, about this. So that's one thing we need to worry about. And then secondly, that, that I believe, that invisible, that it, creating that invisibility for, for Asians with black Americans is why I think Dr. Whitlock got the response that he got is that you're not on the conversation range. We're the only ones who had a 402 year experience of being you know, stripped of everything. What do you have to say about your pain that could have come even close? Why should I even be talking about it? So it's as opposed to saying pain is pain. Inhumanity is inhumanity. And the Bible calls us to be uh, messengers uh, with the ministry of reconciliation. So the question is, how do we fall head and shoulders on our Christian heritage as opposed to our cultural and our, his, our political heritage? And so I have tried uh, to make that my standard. I mean, I think Hey Pen has helped me so much. I mean, we went to dinner, we went to a Chinese, a, um, I almost said Chinese society. This is the first Korean restaurant I've ever been to in my life. And it was not really an experience learning about somebody else's food. I mean, I think whoever said it is so right. Maybe it's Dr. Kim. We have had encounters. We've been in the same meetings. We have been maybe in the same choir, like, Bishop Ulmer, but we haven't done life together. You know, when I let Hey Pien in my house and I'm very private, like that's really special. Okay, and she she violated everything, came in my room, okay. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna think about inviting you back. No. But the fact is we, we did life in that sense. And I didn't wanna come to this conversation without knowing her as a person, not as a category. And so I think that if that's the appeal, not to blame blacks or white or whites or Asians or Latinos or anybody else from not having the conversation. This is the conversation. We're having it now. And we just are calling on everybody who's listening. Don't say this is a great conversation. Go have your own. Because everybody needs to be having this conversation with their kids, their grandkids, their godkids, and everybody else for, uh, for this America to be fully we the people for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say amen for myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, I wonder uh, if we can uh, switch topics. Um, uh, you know, uh, you all have sp uh, spoken uh, eloquently about um, you know, this is a secular conversation, but the metaphors have been religious and uh, biblical. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim uh, talked about um, faith, this idea of faith coupled with friendship, that solidarity means, uh, you know, owning that pain, the stories of other people. Uh, wondering uh, if I could ask, uh, you know, what have you seen, you know, what fruits have you seen uh, from these efforts to foster allyship and, and solidarity? So for me, my wife's a lawyer, graduated from University of Chicago Law. Um, Scalia was one of her professors. And she said, you're, 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 you're coming out, Reverend Whitlock, you're coming out of yourself to the greater self of God, if we need to use a theological term. Uh, I remember a month ago, uh, we're engaged with Hey Ben talking about how we're going to move this Asian Lives Matter. I don't know if that's the term we want to use, but we were having a great conversation. And as I was walking down the street, uh, I saw this giant billboard. I, I live in Maryland, but I was walking down the street in downtown Los Angeles. And on this giant billboard, it said, Asian Lives Matter, stop the hate. And I said, boy, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than the article that we were writing. And I went back that Sunday online and I preached about loving one another, sharing together with one another. We have a nice size congregation. And that Monday and Tuesday, four of my Asian members said, Reverend, this is the first time you have dealt with 
Asian challenges in your social justice messages. Ooh, that was an aha moment for me. Uh, it was it was a good feeling because I spoke to their pain, but it was a wake up moment for me that I had not taken their pain into consideration. That's why I opened up my opening comments by saying, perhaps I'm practicing a narcissistic justice, a narcissistic civil rights movement where I'm only concerned with people who look like me, talk like me, walk like me, as if everybody doesn't have the same challenges. Actually, you know, I just want to add that that was the very conversation when Mark and I, Reverend Dr. Woodlock was connecting with me that when he made that comment, I told him that I felt finally like I was being hurt. I didn't tell him that, but but that's when I said that I, I felt like crying. And then I ended up crying because I felt like there was a, a, a breakthrough. Um, yeah. That's okay. I, that, that I, I think is important, important and needed, needed in our community to really be able to see each other, other and to be truly on the same team. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ipin. Um, and I, I wonder if I could ask the same question of uh, Dr. William Skinner, because uh, I know that uh, you've been putting your time and uh, your efforts and your resources uh, into solidarity, uh, wondering, uh, uh, you know, what stands out for you uh, in terms of uh, those efforts and uh, the fruits of those efforts? I just how little we know about each other. I mean, I'll just give you an example. I hope I don't embarrass him, but last night we went to a Korean restaurant and he brought a young man named Kevin, who's an Asian from her, is Korean from her, uh, her organization and he's younger, so he's millennial. And I'm, you know, I'm used to reaching out to people and making everybody feel comfortable and asking people about themselves and, you know, what what interests them to try to build bridges. That's sort of my nature. And he was silent the entire time. And after a while, I just stopped talking. I was like, okay, uh, either he's bored. <laughs> He's not on his black, he's not on his smartphone, so that's helpful. Um, and later I asked him in the meal, I said, you know, you haven't said anything or, man, why did you, I'm also want to say, why are you here? Like, why did you want to come to dinner? You don't want to share, you're not talking. Is Hey Pien and I are talking. Well, he said something that really woke me up. He said, it's like in his culture, asking people a lot of questions about themselves, it was disrespectful. I, I think I understood that. But I, it never could have occurred to me that maybe what I was doing was disrespectful, you know, in the sense that maybe he felt put upon that I'm a stranger, you know. First of all, I don't like a lot of silence because I will go to sleep or I will get on my smartphone. I have a short attention span. I'm always thinking, acting, doing. So if people are silent, I'll go to work. But I thought last night was a compelling lesson, life lesson about uh, how we need to develop what Dr. Whitlock and Haping have developed is that kind of understanding that the cultures are different. We do encounter life differently. And the one is not better than the other. I mean, my, I'm pretty you know, aggressive and I reach out to people. Everybody is not like that. So I had to accept, it wasn't our age difference. It was just, he's telling me that first of all, and I also, he was overwhelmed by my title or position or whatever that he didn't think he had the right to ask me any questions. I was just overwhelmed by that. Point being that we need to be in the same space to learn more about one another before we can have a whole lot of opinions about one another. And I, I, I want to just thank you, Charles uh, Zhang, for even facilitating this conversation, because I'm learning a lot more about my colleagues than I even knew. And this is very helpful for me 
Um, Dr. Whitlock is challenging me just in some of the things that he's saying that, you know, we're not going to get to black empowerment without Asian empowerment and indigenous empowerment and Latino and Latinx empowerment. We're just not going to do, or poor whites for that matter. We're just not doing. So we're either going to go down this road together or nobody's getting there. So I just want to thank uh, young Kevin, who's in the room, uh, for his honesty with me last night. Because we can learn, it doesn't matter how old you are or young you are, we can learn from one another. The that was an aha moment for me. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to add that I've seen that type of um, disconnect. It's not at the end of the day, we're all human. And, but in Asians, being Asian in America, a lot of times we've not had that safe space. And so in many times we stick to ourselves, mm -hmm. not because we are dismissing or demeaning others, but we don't feel safe. And we find comfort in connecting and sticking with one another. And perhaps those are some moments of other kind of, I think, you know, understanding that I think would be helpful um, as well. I will Hello. say that when a young black um, man on the Metro in DC, when Asians were being attacked the most and in New York where I lived for years, um, attacked a woman, an older, Asian woman, you know, I'm an older black woman. That got to me. That was like, okay, you're gonna either do something or you're gonna witness this happening to you and people who, you know, you care about. Because if it happens to them today, it's gonna happen to us tomorrow. So I got, that was a real aha moment for me. I, I wonder uh, if we could uh, focus on the going forward uh, question, uh, which is that, you know, uh, I really admire each of you for sharing your personal stories. It requires so, uh, so much uh, vulnerability and some risk taking to uh, have an honest conversation like this. Uh, but uh, the end point that we're aiming to uh, uh, of these conversations is true solidarity and uh, allyship. So wondering if I could ask uh, each of you in turn, uh, what that uh, what that path looks like going forward, and what can we uh, in the audience, uh, secular and religious, uh, do to foster and uh, walk that path to uh, allyship and solidarity? So maybe uh, if you don't mind, maybe I could start with uh, Bishop Ulmer. Yeah, very quickly. I I think it's 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 kind of a top down and bottom up. Um, Dr. Skinner has has all kinds of lights are going on in my mind uh, because of the issue of culture, bringing in not just race but culture, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a learning experience. That that's a, that's an education for us, and and we can only do that through relationships and through conversations and through um, you know share, doing. I like that phrase, doing life together. You know, um, in the last several months or so, we've had. Uh, many Asian people come to our church, and and they I've, I've spoken with them, and 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 I noticed I noticed every time they came, they had a gift, you know, and I'm saying, okay, I got that, I got that, but if I get one more of them little cookies that they give, that one little cookie, if I get one more cookie, you know, I'm saying, well, what how, what's up with the cookies? Well, that's a cultural thing, you know, and I'm trying to I'm learning about that, you know, it's it's like when we did a single de Mayo thing at our church. And all the Hondurans and 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 the uh, uh, you know Guatemalans and others who were, who speak Spanish, but their culture was different. It's such an education effort, and so I think it begins on a personal level, like Dr. Skinner's talking. But I also believe mm -hmm. it begins at the top with those of us who are leaders, those of us who, for whatever reason, have have influence. Uh -huh. We've got to filter it down, and then personally, we've got to filter it up. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, and I wonder if I could ask uh, Dr. Whitlock to comment. You know, when Haypen first started talking to me, and uh, when Haypen first shared and wanted us wanted me to get involved, I didn't be like, "Hey, Ben, I'm too busy taking care of black people." <laughs> and uh, what well, I got to feed, I, and I I sat back and I said, "We've been doing the civil rights thing for 50 years." Perhaps she's coming not only for partnership, but she's also coming for learning opportunities. How did you deal with it? 
And I remember having a tough conversation with her. I said, hey, Penn, stop waiting for somebody else to get in the media. Stop waiting for somebody else to write articles. Stop waiting. Get out there and say it loud how you feel. Show your emotion. Do it. And, and that for me was big because it was the first time she calls me a mentor, but this is the first time I shared with her what we as African-Americans are doing and have done. Unfortunately, sometimes I think we persecute one another by perception and we perceive that we know. And when we don't know, we persecute them by our silence and our failure to share. Thank you, doctor. Uh, wondering if I could ask uh, uh, Dr. William Skinner what that path forward looks like. I think everybody, oh. Everybody Everyone is so busy today that I, I dare not ask anyone to do a big thing. I mean, we put together a resolution, which is basically says, we are in solidarity. We we have not always loved each other. We've been actually hurtful to one another, but now we can, that was a decision. Now we can make a new decision that we're going to go forward together. That's what the resolution said, okay? So at the end of the show, you know, you can uh, either through uh, facla.org or skinnerleaders.org, sign on the resolution, do the simple act. And I think the simple act will take you through the next thing to do. But just saying, I want to stand for solidarity. You haven't left your home. You, need, you don't have to leave your, your chair. <laughs> just go on and sign the resolution. Dr. Kim. I think we have an opportunity going forward to learn from and learn with one another. So I'm going to pick up on the theme that's already been articulated. I'll give you a specific example. So my wife, um, Taiwanese American, uh, has participated in a racial trauma work group that was formed by um, a, a Center for Racial Reconciliation led by an African American. And the experience from the African-American community of racial trauma and how to deal with kind of generational trauma is, um, is a set of resources that were very, very powerful for my wife, who now is equipped to share this in the Asian-American community. And we've already begun to do some of that. That's a really powerful shared learning experience that spreads um, the opportunity uh, to to um, em equip and empower broader community. Um, the second thing I would say is, as we learn with and from one another, we'll begin to see what the issues are that deeply impact other people. The issue of immigration reform, for instance, has often been um, primarily focused in on the Latinx community, understandably so. But there are segments in America where the major immigrant group that's impacted are Asian Americans, not uh, Hispanics or uh, Latinx community. Uh, and the kind of advocacy that could exist from the African American community on behalf of immigration reform, for instance, um, is a very powerful movement of advocacy in spaces that impact Asian Americans. Uh, but the reverse is also true. Education reform is often a deep concern for, uh, for African-American community that Asian-American community needs to learn more about and enter into. So there's some really practical ways oh. that we can start owning the issues that impact other communities, recognizing as we own these mutual issues that really all communities will benefit. The last, because of course I'm a faith leader, the last thing that I would advocate for is if we're going to present a message of good news of Jesus Christ, and I speak as a Christian to other Christians, one of the most powerful demonstrations would be the realization that faith can bridge gaps that we all yearn to see bridged. My belief that the message of Jesus would be so enriched by a visible demonstration of reconciliation in action 
I think is for churches a profound opportunity to say, if you're serious about the mission of the church, you need to be serious about the mission of reconciliation because that is the message that makes a difference in this world. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'll invite any of you to provide uh, closing thoughts. I, I think this is where it starts. Uh, and I'll, I'll echo what, what, what Walter said and, and uh, Dr. Barbara. I think it, it starts like this. Uh, it cannot end here, but it starts here. It starts with um, uh, the cookie. It starts with uh, the Korean restaurant. It starts with dialogues like this. Uh, I, I uh, un, 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 unreservedly and unapologetically, I, I want to join with Dr. Kim in saying my personal belief is that there is a strength and a power um, in faith uh, in, in, in hope uh, in Christ that cannot be taken out of this equation. In other words, I think that that's where, that's where we can start we cannot stop there, but, but I think that's where we can start and how we, uh, if you will, infiltrate the rest of the culture um, from a faith perspective um, can make a difference. I don't disagree on, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't disagree on the faith power, <laughs> but right now the faith community um, is not all that influential because we need to get our act together. I mean, I think it's true and I'm not gonna sit up here and act like we got it going on like that because we don't. But it is true that those of us who call on our faith as our bottom line, and that might be a remnant, may not be everybody, may not be a hundred million people who named the name of Jesus. Maybe it's just a fall a few. We're only a few today and I think we're having an impact already. I don't think it takes a house full. I think the issue is that I'll go to myself. I need, because we need to make a personal con, uh, commitment because I can't commit black people, okay? I need to make a commitment as a leader that when I'm speaking in the space of race and, and justice, that I include Asian, indigenous, Latinx community, period. I could just start there. Just make it, make it plain that it's all of us. I'm not against anybody. It's not against white. I'm just saying when you talk about injustice, those are the communities that are mostly affected. We can, I can make a commitment today that when I do my blogs and my, my op-eds and whatever, I'm going to broaden my own language. That's where we can start. I, I, I think we who are within the faith community impact people. We have a, an audience that will come and listen whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Judaism, we have a community of people that come together for a specific purpose at a specific place at a specific time. When I invited Hey Penn to come and speak at a, the church that I had in, in California, everybody absolutely loved hearing what she had to say. Uh, and they, certainly requested her to come back. I was moved to Maryland, so I couldn't do that, but I wanted her to come back and, and speak in Maryland after the pandemic, or certainly when we have church again. <laughs> but I'm, I'm asking that you invite, you push uh, your pastor, or you, if you're leading a, a congregation, invite a pen, invite uh, Bishop Kenny Armour, invite Reverend Dr. William Skinner, invite William Kim, Dr. Kim, but but change it up a little bit because leadership sometimes sometimes we're stuck on stupid, and unless we are moved by the congregation, sometimes change does not take place. Mm -hmm. Invite somebody outside of your uh, your pulpit here, your your pulpit leader, to come and speak in your church and you'll see the measurable impact that it will have. I wonder if I could invite Hippin to close us out. Well, I am again, so grateful. First again, thank you Charles for partnering with us uh, in hearing me uh, of the importance of this conversation that you recognize, 
but I'm also again equally grateful to the amazing leaders that are in this room. I know for the interest of time that we did not uh, e elaborate on the great influence that each of these speakers today who have joined me uh, for this panel. But I guess I want to say that my journey began here way back uh, when um, in junior high, I went to a, uh, an awards event that was held at a black church and uh, the black choir hearing them, I realized like church could be fun. <laughs> and that planted a seed. Um, and in subsequent time that I've come to be curious and to have not just about the black community, but each of the different communities that I have encountered and I want to say whether it's faith or love wins, I know that for myself, it was my appreciation and respect uh, for these leaders, especially in the black community. And yet that disconnect, that inconsistency is what kind of kept me in that uh, ring, right? And so I would like to ask each one of you as well to join me when we do encounter people of the other. <laughs> behaving in certain ways that may be inconsistent with what we think people should be, that perhaps to say, why are they that way? What is impacting their lives? Because at the end of the day, I think we're all human. And especially in this country, uh, the system discriminates all. <laughs> they don't discriminate who they discriminate. And, and so in that way, again, to take the time to pause and to dig a little bit deeper and to, again, start building those relationships and to give each other the benefit of doubt that perhaps they're all good people, but why are they behaving? What is causing that pain that is uh, allowing this conflict to arise? Um, as Dr. Uh, William Skinner mentioned, that we have this resolution to show the world that we are starting on this journey. We will very much uh, appreciate that you could join us in this journey, but also in your individual conversations and in the places of your office, your family, uh, wherever you may be. So again, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, and I think I've read some comments in the comment section that people are hopeful. I know I became hopeful uh, just by this journey. And I think that our country will, and the world will be so much better if each of us could take on this journey. So again, a big thank you and gratitude.